In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. When the risen Lord, Jesus, came to his disciples in that house in Jerusalem, he spoke peace and mercy to, to the very companions who had fled from him only days before. There they were still shut away in fear. They evidently hadn't taken in what Mary had proclaimed to them just hours before. I have seen the risen Lord, he lives. Whereas the disciples, they're still in a shadow of fear and grief. Perhaps wondering why, if Mary's right, if her experience is authentic, Jesus hasn't appeared to them. Why is he keeping away from them? And so he doesn't. He came to them as well. And now that they're facing their crucified Lord, he doesn't go straight to reproving them for not believing Mary, for fleeing in the face of his crucifixion. Instead, he breathes new life into them and entrusts them with a ministry of forgiveness, with sharing his mercy with the world. And in some ways it is this mercy, it's the gift of new life on the other side of their failure and their fear that Thomas finds harder to accept than he did what cost him the pain in the first place. Earlier on, John reports about Jesus deciding to return to Jerusalem and Thomas says, let's, let's us go also so that we might die with him. Whether he's declaring his willingness to follow Jesus to the grave or there's a dark irony in his words, perhaps that's his way of questioning the wisdom of their journey. But in either way, at a time when disciples like the sons of Zebedee were still hoping to win a place either side of Jesus, in an earthly kingdom. Thomas saw where things were going and he stayed. He followed Jesus as far as the garden of Gethsemane. Whereas Thomas was willing, was more willing than most to face a harsh reality like the crucifixion, what he finds far harder to believe is what atones for that pain. The gift of resurrection, the gift of life through the precious lifeblood that flows through those open wounds that Jesus shows to the disciples in his hands and in his side. Thomas says, I want to see those marks and I want to touch those wounds. And he doesn't want to accept a reconciliation, a gospel that defies the painful reality of his Saviour's death. He's not alone in this. There's a certain temperament that finds it far easier to believe hard truths, the things which don't suit us, than to accept the things which do. After all, it's far less likely that I'll be kidding myself in what I accept to be true, if it isn't to my own advantage. It's harder when it would actually fulfill a desire, when it would heal a wound. It's as if Thomas says, God forbid that my desire should colour what I believe to be true about reality. But if the one who conceived this reality loves us, if he loves Thomas, we can trust that he's instilled that desire in Thomas for a reason. Thomas wanted to be with Jesus. He wanted to share in his intimacy with the Father of all. And in the same way, that a person's senses are sharpened by hunger to search out food in the sights and the sense of those around them. He had to trust that his own desire could help him to see deeper into reality, not to deny it. His senses were sharpened enough by longing to recognize in the risen body of Christ when he appeared to him. In those glorious wounds, his senses were sharpened enough to recognize what he longed for, the living God. 
He doesn't just say, Jesus is risen. He says, my Lord and my God. The ancient Pope Leo the Great, he says, it's the strength of great minds and the light of firmly faithful souls to focus your affections where you cannot direct your gaze. In the end, even Thomas had to attend to more than his eyes could see to make the confession that he did, to recognise in the risen body, which he could see, the divinity of Christ, which is a reality that goes beyond the evidence of the senses. It's this same willingness to perceive more than what's on the surface, to see the more, that is at the heart of entering into the sacramental life of our church. We can't see that spirit of Jesus that was first breathed into those apostles. We can't see it moving among us. And yet in a very real sense, the spirit is who brought us here. And that willingness to see the more, it's that, not the doubt, which is the strength of our intellect or our soul. It's the measure of it, as much as it was of Thomas. It's the reason we're still speaking of Thomas 2,000 years on. Jesus sort of gently rebukes Thomas, saying, are you believing just because I had to prompt you with this special visitation? Because ultimately Thomas' confession, it had to remain steadfast, even once Jesus had ascended to the Father even once Jesus was gone in the flesh. Thomas had to learn to keep his affections focused on that reality he could no longer direct his gaze upon. And blessed are we if we do the same. You or I do not have to touch the risen Jesus in the flesh to be touched by him spiritually to be reborn as Thomas was reborn through the open wound in his side. That is the gift of a common faith, one which in principle is open to all people. We are asked to go beyond our own limited experience of reality, to enter into that of an apostle like Thomas or like John, and to trust the authority of it. That is part of the mysterious unity of the new humanity that is being born through Jesus Christ, that their experience becomes our own. And we are invited through the scriptures to let their very real struggle, a struggle that is as much born of love as it is of fear or doubt, their very real struggle through the events of Easter, we're invited to let that become our own, that their joy might be ours also. This is, by the way, the deepest purpose of the sacrament of confession, which finds its roots in this same gospel from today. Within the life of the church, our priests and bishops who have inherited that ministry of reconciliation entrusted to the apostles, they're a bit like midwives, as St Paul might say, helping to bring this new humanity to birth in us, if you forgive the sins of any, Jesus says, if you release them from them, then they are released, they are forgiven. And whereas so often it is our doubts that isolate us, that cut us off from others, if we entrust any of them, any of our wounds, to the light of faith, then we are made one, reunited with a whole body of humanity through the church. It is in the power of that spirit breathed into the apostles by the Lord to blow those doubts away like so many clouds of darkness and to help a person draw closer to the wounded side of our Lord. It is the purpose of the sacrament of confession that through that ministry, one might really be released 
from those scruples and be made alive to the reality of the resurrection. To be drawn nearer to our crucified Lord and to the mystery of our redemption through his blood. <laughs>